so we are talking about prayer. Uh, and there's there's loads of different moments in my life that I can look back to uh, that were quite significant to do with prayer. Uh, and one of which is when I was about 14, 15 years old, my church that I grew up in, a place called High Wycombe. No, <laughs> never works, but it's worth a go. Uh, we did a 24-7 prayer week. So we did, uh, the prayer room was open all, all day through the, the day, all day through the night um, for a whole week uh, at a little chapel. And my brother and his mate had booked in for a 1 a.m. till 3 a.m. slot. And they invited me along. Uh, and a friend, and we thought, yeah, let's go for it. Uh, it's a good excuse to stay up late. So we we decided to go for it. And I went. I remember telling my friend at school, who was not a Christian, that this is what I was doing. And I remember him just staring at me so blankly, just could not comprehend what anyone could possibly be praying about for two hours. He was like, how, how is that going to work? Uh, and I kind of, agree, I thought the same. I thought, I don't know how this is going to work. Um, but we got there 1 a.m. And, and we started to worship and sing together. Uh, and pretty soon there was this amazing sense of the Holy Spirit in the room. Uh, and I started to read different bits of the Bible, writing different verses down, writing down the choruses of the songs, kind of praying a bit, singing a bit, uh, spent some time just like lying on a beanbag. And then before long, uh, that was it. The time was up, two hours gone. Uh, and we went, went home, obviously, for a celebratory McDonald's on the way. Uh, but the whole thing was incredible. Um, and the prayer room was good too. That was a joke about McDonald's being really great. Uh, but prayer for me after that kind of changed. It really changed the game for me for prayer. Um, because before that, I think kind of like what my friend was getting at, it's very easy to fall into this understanding of prayer where prayer is, God, here's a problem. Please give me a solution. God, here's another problem. Please give me a solution. God, here's my family or friends problems. Please give them solutions. Uh, and the problem with praying in that formula is that what happens when the solutions that we want uh, don't happen in the way that we want them to happen? Uh, and it can feel a bit like when uh, we have a genie in a bottle, but we've run out of wishes. Uh, and what I learned that day in the prayer room was that Jesus is all about relationship, that the currency uh, for God uh, is his relationship with us, that he, he doesn't care essentially about uh, how eloquent or beautiful our prayers are, but he cares about us as his children and what he really wants for us uh, is relationship. And I learned something about um, perspective through that time in the prayer room, that when we're close to God and when we're, when we're communing with him, we have this greater heavenly perspective, which enables us to pray uh, from that place. I think that the gift of prayer is, is a, about perspective on how big God is and how small we are. Um, and I'd love to encourage you, if you've not been to a prayer room or spent time in our wonderful prayer shed, especially in, at unsociable hours, I, I really think it's life changing. And I'd really encourage you uh, to sign up to have a go. But I wonder, when do you feel closest to God? It might not be in the prayer room at, at 1 a.m. It might be when you're walking the dog or reading your Bible or out in the Peak District or, or something else. But when you're feeling close to God, how does that impact your life? How does that change you? And I wonder if you can relate to this idea that being close to God uh, gives you this healthy perspective, which enables you to pray in a better way. Because we are, we're midway through the Lord's Prayer, this series going through the most famous prayer of all time. Uh, and we're looking at Jesus's response to the question his disciples ask him, teach us how to pray. And Tim Keller, he talks about the Lord's Prayer, says it's the greatest theology that we have on prayer. And it gives us the keys to unlock the riches of prayer. And he says, the Lord's Prayer is an invitation to daily come face to face with Jesus, uh, the King of the universe, to pour our hearts out to him and then to sense him loving and listening to us. Uh, and I want to suggest to you today that the Lord's Prayer is about perspective. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 13, and it's going to be on the screens. It says this, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the streets and in the synagogues um, by, and to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. 
then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. It's a pretty solid prayer. It's a pretty good prayer. There's a lot in there. And we're looking today at verse 10, which is, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Or your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Now, did you know the Lord's Prayer is split into two halves? There are two sides of the Lord's Prayer. The first half of the Lord's Prayer is all about God. It's all about looking up. So if we go to the next slide, we will see that we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And then the second half of the, so we've got your, your, your. And the second half of the prayer is us, us, us. So we see, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, and I think this helps us to see that Jesus is trying to teach us a little bit about perspective, that we need to sit in our God-focused prayer before we go to the us-focused prayer, that we start with the God-focused prayer before we go to the us-focused prayer. And I wonder if you're good at doing that, if you're good at starting with the God-focused prayer. Because if you're anything like me, you skip it. You skip it straight away. You say, God, this is what I want. This is how it's going to go. This is all the things I need. These are the things my family and friends need. I would like it now, please. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anyone can relate to that. But Jesus, he doesn't say that, does he? He says we start with God. So we heard Tom brilliantly speak about um, our Father in heaven, talking about God's identity as our loving Father, but also this ruler uh, who lives in the heavenlies. And then we heard Bryony um, talk about hallowed be your name, acknowledging the holiness and the beauty found in all of God's many names, that we focus on him. Uh, and then I would like us today to look at your kingdom come and your will be done, the next two God-focused prayers. So my simple challenge for the first one is this. Are you praying for thy kingdom or my kingdom? It rhymes, it's good, doesn't it? Thy kingdom or my kingdom. Are you praying for the kingdom of God to come in your prayers? Or are you praying for your own kingdom to come? It's a pretty challenging question, uh, but what does it mean to pray for your kingdom come? What, what does that mean? I think essentially we are praying for uh, God to be king in the kingdom. We're, we're praying for God's, God's rule and God's reign. So what does that mean? It means that we are praying for God to rule in every sphere of our lives, in family, in friends, uh, in, in our schools, in our sports teams, whatever we get up to. We're praying for God to transform culture, church, people, everything by being the king that's over and has dominion, rule and reign over all things. Now, this is quite straightforward. I think we're quite good at this as a church. Like we kind of get this idea that we, we want to proclaim Jesus is Lord. And I think the challenge for us is about our framing. Like when we do sit down to pray, are we really thinking about those different areas and really declaring, God, would you be the king in this place? Would people know that you are the king? And this, the second part to, the, to praying your kingdom come, which I think is a bit more challenging, is that I think when we pray your kingdom come, we are essentially praying my kingdom go, uh, if that makes any sense at all. It did in my head. If we're praying your kingdom come, we have to be praying my kingdom go. Because if there is a kingdom, there, ha there can be one ruler, uh, unless there's, not, there's more than one. <laughs> but in this instance, we're, we're looking for who is going to be the king in a place. 
And if our lives are a kingdom, then it's either Jesus who is the king or it's ourselves or, or maybe even something else. But the big thing that we all wrestle with is having something called pride locked inside each of us. Uh, and every day there's a fresh battle that takes place in your life, which is, am I going to call the shots today or, or is God going to call the shots today? Because your pride is going to be trying to elbow Jesus off the throne. Uh, and that's, that's not just something you can fix for good. That's a daily, that's a daily battle. Uh, and I think it's something that we all face. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, I think that we are invited to surrender our pride and get off the throne. And it's a daily invitation to recognize Jesus is actually the king in my life and I'm going to take a step back. Uh, and, and as we get used to praying this prayer, we get used to this daily task of submitting to God. Um, and I, I recently, I was on a, a stag do recently in Lisbon. It was a bit leery. Uh, there were some guys uh, that I was going with who I know from back in the day who are not Christians. They're not following the Lord. They're not praying this prayer, your kingdom come. But instead, they're following this cultural narrative that we all experience, which is build your own kingdom, do what feels good, like help yourself to the things and be the ruler in your own little world. Um, and it's amazing to see how quickly and how well that path can be trodden if you're praying my kingdom come instead of thy kingdom come uh, and the way that that can lead you to certain activities. Uh, it's pretty staggering. So it's an important prayer for us to pray. So I pray, Lord, you'd help us to be followers of Jesus who pray thy kingdom and not my kingdom. Amen. And secondly, I think slightly more challenging is, are we praying thy will or my will? This one's pretty, pretty challenging. Are you praying for the will of God to be done in your prayers? Or are you praying for your will to be done in your prayers? It's a really hard question. And my follow-up question is, is it okay to pray for my will in my prayers? Is it okay to pray for my will in my prayers? Or are we praying, your will be done, my will be don't? Is it like God's and not mine, a bit like your kingdom, not my kingdom? Or, or can we pray our prayers as well? Well, I think that we can pray our will. In Psalm 37 verse 4, it says, Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your hearts. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 11, it says, If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts um, to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? And what's implicit there is that Jesus is saying you can ask God for good things, that we can ask Jesus for our will. I think it's okay that he is a giver of good gifts and he invites us to pray for the things that we want. He says, ask anything in my name and it will be given to you. So we find us in ourselves in a funny position where Jesus is teaching us to pray by saying, pray your will be done. So why is that? And what does that mean? I think it means two really simple things. The first thing I think it means is surrender. I think to pray for God's will to be done is to surrender to outcomes that we may not want. So simply to pray for God's will to be done is to surrender to outcomes we may not want. And to surrender to those outcomes we may not want is to trust in God. Trust that our heavenly father is who he says he is in the scriptures and will look after us. And what we need to remember at this point is that we are still in the your, your, your side of the Lord's prayer and the us, us, us. That's coming next. We do get to ask him for stuff, um, but we start by ordering ourselves correctly and saying, do you know what, God, your will be done. We submit to Jesus uh, and we trust him. And I think we're invited in the Lord's Prayer, especially in the first half, to surrender and trust to God. That's what the whole first half is all about. We surrender and we trust that you are our Heavenly Father and you are in heaven. We surrender and trust that your name is holy and that you are who you say you are. And we surrender and trust that your Lordship, your rule and reign is better than ours. And we surrender and trust that your will is good and it is in line with what Scripture teaches. But that's pretty difficult, isn't it? Because bad stuff happens a lot and stuff is really, really hard. 
Um, and so it's really, really difficult. And often when we're reciting the Lord's Prayer, we kind of throw away that line so easily, your kingdom come, your will be done. But we could be really in the thick of wrestling with this question. Uh, Re Reformation theologian Martin Luther, I've got a lovely passport picture of him here. Uh, so he says this, that when we pray, your will be done, he suggests that we're essentially praying, give me the grace to be okay with your will, crucifying my will, very intense language, even though it may lead me to all sorts of painful places and dark valleys. Now, it's a very uh, interesting thing to think about this, this little piece of the prayer. It's not straightforward and we can't take it for granted that when we are praying the Lord's prayer, we must consider that we are essentially inviting God's God to rule and reign in our lives as King and as the one whose will we submit to. And that's a big deal. When I was at university, uh, I was in a relationship for a, a long while, like three, three and a half years. Um, and I thought, you know, this is it. I was pretty comfortable was, was very much locked into that relationship. And um, I remember we met up and, and she said to me, oh, Luke, I don't think this is going to work out. I think we're, we're on different paths. Um, love you, bye. Thanks so much for the memories. And I'm not looking for sympathy, but I was crushed. I was pretty crushed. I know, pretty beat up about it. It was really difficult. Um, but through that process, there was something in the peace of God that was there uh, as, as she was not someone who was following Jesus. And I just felt like the gods say, like, I'm, I'm cool. This is the cool I've got on your life. Uh, and this relationship is not the best for you for this calling. Um, and that was a comfort in that time. Uh, and I was reminded of Isaiah 55, which is your ways are higher than my ways. And that you know, it wasn't too trivial for me at the time, but it's a relatively trivial example of what is a really, really difficult issue. Uh, and when we're talking about people who are suffering, people who are ill, and we're praying and praying and praying, and they, they don't get better, uh, and sometimes they die, what, what do we do with this theology then? What do we do with that prayer then? Does that mean uh, if it happens and, and I've been praying, does that mean it's not God's will? Uh, or, or what do we do with that? Um, and that's a really hard question to answer, so I'm just going to dodge it, and we're going to move on. <laughs> what I do want to say is if you're going through that, um, I want to invite all of us to, to be pushing after these questions. We, we have to be exploring these difficult questions uh, and, and talking to each other about them and not burying them. It can't be a source of shame to have these questions. And if you're angry with God, I think it's so important you express that. To, to God and to other people uh, because we can't hide from this stuff because it's really, really raw and really real. And if you're in that place, I want you to know that we love you, like we're standing with you. We want to pray alongside you uh, and we want to be family for you. And um, there genuinely isn't time to, to unpack all the theology. I'll say a quick word on it in a moment, but I'd love to signpost a few resources. Like we're going through the prayer course at the moment as tables. I'm really valuing that. And there's just three books out of lots I could have mentioned. God on Mute is a fantastic about unanswered prayer. Really easy read, lots of stories, really, really fantastic. I think um, Tim Keller's Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering is the best theological unpacking of the problem of pain. Uh, the question of if God is so loving, why is there suffering? If you want the theological answer, I think that book is, is amazing. Uh, and Life on Fire is by a guy called James Aladdin, who is my favorite preacher on prayer. He, he is all about war, spiritual warfare, the power of prayer. And that's a book all about like how to walk in the, the power of God um, when you're facing really hard stuff and what does that look like. Uh, and that's maybe a different perspective that you might be used to. But what I want to say um, in the midst of this difficult question is, is what I was saying at the start, which is God deals in relationships. God deals in intimacy. Uh, and the key to, um, to everything in prayer is, is about our Heavenly Father loving us as children of God. And everything has to come from that place of relationship with Him. Uh, and finding those places where you feel close to God really is the key to having a thriving prayer life. Because He wants to give good gifts to us. Um, but sometimes 
Sometimes in this world, there's suffering, there's tragedy, and we can't explain it, and we don't have the answers, and that can be really, really difficult. And I think when that happens, we've got two choices. We can say, God, you are real, and I don't know what's happening, but I'm going to choose to trust you, and we're going to walk through this dark valley, and you will be my shepherd. Or we can say, do you know what, God, you've let me down you've, this too, one too many times. I'm cutting the cord. I'm going it alone. Uh, and I think you'll find that the valley is just as dark, but there is no shepherd to guide you. And I know which version I would rather walk out. Uh, and just to summarize that little bit, there's an amazing quote that I love, which summarizes this well, which is by a lady called Corey Ten Boom. And she suggests that when you are in the middle of a tunnel, it's not a good time to get off the train. So I want to finish just by pointing us to Jesus, if that's all right. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that you may be familiar with. This is just the day before Jesus goes to be crucified, to be tortured uh, in front of an audience. And it says this, Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said, my soul, this is Jesus Christ talking. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. I just want to read that one more time. I think someone needs to hear this, that this is the, the Lord of the universe. Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And I included that last verse because just to encourage anyone who's fallen asleep in a Bible study early in the morning or even preparing for this sermon, perhaps, uh, you're in good company. This is the ultimate example of your kingdom come, your will be done in action. This is Jesus, gritty, real. There's so much humanity in this passage. Uh, in Luke's gospel, he talks about Jesus sweating like drops of blood, like the height of human anxiety. And yet Jesus comes before God and he, he walks out the Lord's prayer. He, he acknowledges oh, my father in heaven. He says, my father, dad, and he lies in front, he lies down, face down on the ground. It's this posture of surrender, this posture of acknowledging who Jesus is. Uh, and then he says, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. He throws his will in before God's will. So if Jesus does it, I think it's okay if we do it. May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will but as you will. It's this beautiful picture of intimacy and submission that is really challenging. It's really, really challenging. But if he can do it, uh, then he says in his good word that he's given us his spirit so that we can be like him. And so I want to invite us to be followers of Jesus who pray thy kingdom and not my kingdom and followers of Jesus who pray thy will and not my will but most of all I want to invite us to be followers of Jesus who who care so much about the intimacy we have with our heavenly father that if we can be people who are close to God then whatever we face we will have the keys that we need in prayer so Jesus, would you give us, uh, give us hearts that are submitted to you? Amen.